So, um, all right, let's get started. Uh, I would like to welcome you all on a talk about microservice. Um, for sure, all of you must have heard about microservices, but let me ask you a simple question. How many of you are developing microservices in day-to-day -day life? Cool. Uh, so I hope after the end of this presentation, each and every one of you will have enough information on how to develop and write your own uh, microservices. Mm, I would like to kick off this talk by discussing problems, problems that are not only relevant to a big software giants, but problems that are also relevant to a medium-sized software house, and we will take a look on how monolithic and microservice architecture can handle those problems. Then we will take a look on some of the core concepts behind microservices that will help us to build and understand the code that I'm going to show you um, during uh, coding uh, session. And uh, finally, as we know, everything has its own plus and minus, so does the microservice architecture, and we will take a look on what's the price someone have to pay for using this architecture. Uh, here is a short info about me. Um, I work usually with JVM-related technology. Here is my blog, and if you want to find more slides, follow the link. But let's... Uh, Okay, uh, on monolithic. So before I, I start about microservice, I want to make a, a statement that I'm not against monolithic. Uh, and I don't mean that every monolithic looks like this. Usually in day-to-day -day life, uh, monolithic applications had good vision. I mean, they were developed with a good vision, but the packaging was not done right. And usually what we encounter in day-to-day -day life looks something like this, but it's not written in some holy book that monolithic must look like this. Um, so what are the common problems? First is complexity. Uh, complexity can come in many flavors. It can come in a form of new business story, competitive advantage, uh, new user stories, you name them. But complexity is not this nice guy that comes to your door and asks you politely, could you please let me in? Uh, complexity just come, slams your door into half, and if you try to hide yourself under the pillow, it will still find you. And if you just, you know, try to hide yourself under the bed, it is still going to find you. So the point is that we as our developers, we have to face the complexity. But in monolithic world, the complexity hits us directly on the face. So for instance, if you want to increase the productivity and want to, for instance, uh, move people around the project or even add new developers, uh, increasing productivity uh, doesn't go hand in hand. Why? Because a new developer have to go through a big readme file, have to install a whole set of tools, database servers, God knows what not. It is not disappearing. It's still there, but it is moved from to the distributed layer. So it means the interaction layer. And that's important to know. So the complexity is not disappearing. It's just moving to a different uh, layer. Um, since we talk about monolithic application, um, what we spoke about is a long-term commitment to a tech stack. And usually what happens is when we are working on a monolithic application, uh, we don't have the leisure to rewrite a significant part of the monolithic application or even a full monolithic application just to upgrade a tech stack. So we as a programmers are quite good in doing work around. So we try to bake those missing features in our tech stack. Uh, and we end up with something like this. In microservice world, we have the leisure to use the appropriate tools to do the job. So for instance, if you know a new library that is going to help you to ship your business use case faster, you can just build a microservice using that set of technology or library. I'm not saying that each and every microservice should be developed in a separate language. What I'm saying is there is a possibility to do so and thus avoid workaround. Uh, in in monolithic world, when we speak, we speak about a multi-responsibility uh, application. So multiple responsibilities are baked into a single application. And thus, when a new func a functionality pops up, we don't know which part of the system it belongs to. Whereas in a microservice world, it is built around a single responsibility principle. So when a new functionality pops up, we don't have to figure day and night, like which part of the system this microservice should belong to. We can just... Uh, easily figure this information out thanks to single responsibility principle. Uh, it's quite easy to maintain standards. Uh, why? Because in monolithic world, 
all of us are, or let's say the bunch of developers are working on the same code base, and thus it is easier to add a check style or add some bunch of um, instruction, and each and every one is going to follow it. Uh, however, it's hard to uh, kind of have a wall which separate the good and ugly part. So for instance, it's it's quite easy to pollute the code in a monolithic application because let's say you go to a holiday and someone have touched that code and he don't have the same set of skills that you possesses and he can just somehow want to fix this um, this bug and they can introduce some a code that is not as high quality as you were writing it. On the other hand side, in microservice world, when we are working in microservice, we have small teams. Thus, it is easier to maintain the quality. Why? Because the mantra of microservice, you build it, you ship it, you own it. Uh, however, this, this kind of principle also makes it hard to maintain standards because now we have large number of small teams and it takes some effort to make all of them to agree on some, let's say, specific set of uh, standards. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it requires some hard work. Um, and finally, refactoring. We all want to refactor code and go home and still our application should be working in a single piece. But usually when we start refactoring a monolithic application, we start with something like this. And down the road, we end up with something like this. Uh, why? Because unintentionally, we have to touch those part of the application that even we don't want to touch. Why? Because everything is so tightly glued together in a monolithic world. And hence, refactoring becomes quite difficult uh, depending on the scope of the project and how big your monolithic application is. Uh, whereas in microservice architecture, as long as you are not going to break your SLA uh, and your APIs, you don't even have to re imagine or have to kind of figure out how many moving parts of my system have. All you need to do is confine your uh, full intention in refactoring the microservice. Thus, microservices is easier to refactor, whereas um, monolithics are harder. Uh, so what are microservices? Well, they are, they are a way to build application. They follow the component-oriented approach. So for instance, the full application consists of small number of components, and those components communicate with each other via language agonistic API. The word micro here is quite, quite um, important. I still remember back from my childhood days when I was going to uh, attend my high school, uh, I asked my teacher what micro is, and he told me 10 to the power minus 6. And I asked him, so what is 10 to the power minus 9? And he said, it's milli, and then I asked, and minus 3. Uh, and he told me that uh, it's for sure not uh, micro. And the Somehow the, the definition, what he taught me when I was small, is still valid. Uh, whereas when we apply the same term micro in computer architecture, micro means something small and service is something that will help us to do our work. Uh, but the, the problem with something small is something small for me can be big for you and vice versa. So in microservice, when we are building microservice, don't think like microservice means 10 lines of code, four methods, or X lines of code. The word micro signifies more towards the component. So each and every component should do one thing, and it should be as small as possible. So micro is not equivalent to the number of lines of code. I'm not saying that you should write 1,000 lines or 100,000 lines in microservices. What I'm saying is just, Think about micro in terms of component, not in terms of how many lines and spaces you are going to add in a code. Uh, so what are the core concepts behind microservices? So first is service registry. How many of you know this concept? OK, so let me break this down. So let's imagine that we have two computers, computer A and computer B, and they want to communicate with each other. Or let, we can tell them even service A and service B. And let's assume that the communication is plain vanilla flavor, so we don't have a load balancer or some fancy middleware sitting between and routing the request. So what service A need to communicate with service B, it needs to know the IP address and the port on which uh, service B is running, and then it can ask for some information. But as soon as we step into the microservice world, our assumptions are broken. Uh, why? Because one of the key aspects of microservices is scalability on demand, which means that we can scale when and how we want. 
Uh, and in order to do or fulfill such a promise, we end up usually deploying our microservices in an infrastructure that provides no guarantee that next time when we will be launching our microservices, they will be running on a particular port. So you may ask, for instance, why we use such an infrastructure uh, and where such infrastructure exists. And I can say, for example, cloud. So when you deploy something on a cloud, the cloud provider is free to choose whatever port. Uh, to run your application, and even it can assign some dynamic IP. So what we need in a, uh, in a microservice world, we need a single source of truth where we can go and ask questions like, hey, do you know how many instances of service B are there up and running? Or do you know the port on which service B is listening or the IP address? And this single source of truth is called service registry. Uh, there are various implementation of this concept that I explained to you, but here are quite popular one. Uh, and which of them you should use? So let's say if you are um, building application in which um, events like zone-based partitioning and network-based partitioning is more rarely to happen. So something like your own private data centers, you can use Zookeeper. Why? Because it is consistent and it provides partitioning. Uh, but as soon as we are going to deploy on an infrastructure where events like zone-based partitioning and um, network-based partitioning are, happen, are, are going to happen in a regular basis, then consistency becomes less important and availability becomes quite important. And Eureka is the one, um, it's open source and it implements and fulfill, um, fulfill uh, availability. Uh, promise here and console is the uh, is another implementation it also provides some rich set uh, of features but for the sake of this presentation i'm going to restrict myself to eureka uh, eureka is an open source service registry um, it's on github uh, hosted and uh, uh, prepared by netflix guys it consists of two parts server and a client and in order to uh, help you understand how the client and the server works let me show you the communication between them. So first thing the client should do is the client should register uh, themselves to the server. So he does by sending an initial heartbeat after a 30 second. And once the client is registered, he have to constantly inform the server that I'm alive. And he does so by periodically sending the heartbeat, which is after every 30 second. And we call it renewing the leasing. And what happens when the client does not fulfill his agreement? Well, the server waits for around 90 seconds, and then he assumes that the client is dead, and he removes them from the registry. But let's assume that our client is up and running. The next event that happens between client and a server is fetching the registry. Uh, and what fetching registry means is that the server have all the information, like how many instances of microservices are there and how many microservices are there. And client fetch this information using fetching registry. And important thing is he cache this information locally. And as you know, every cache becomes stale with time. So the client have to update this information. And during update, he don't ask for each and every time all the information uh, from the server from the beginning. What he does, it, it asks for the only the differences between the last fetch cycle and the current fetch cycle. So if you are deploying it on a cloud, this communication is not so, uh, not so expensive. And finally, when the client wants to um, go out, then he sends a shutdown event, and the server just shut down uh, the microservice client in this case. The second concept that is quite important is uh, load balancing and why do we need a load balancer so for instance on a server we can have 10 instance of a service b up and running and when i ask to the server give me list of service b he can say okay you have 10 options to talk to but which one should i pick should i pick the first one the last one or the middle one uh, believe me or not in a distributed world to answer such questions can end up providing a richer user experience or a worse user experience. And uh, thankfully, Ribbon is another open source component provided by Netflix. It's a client-side load balancer. Uh, it have tons of cool feature. For instance, it have zone affinity, which means if you enable this feature, it is only going to pick the server that are in the same zone. Thus, you can avoid the cross-zone trafficking and even provide a richer user experience. 
Uh, failure is something which uh, ribbon handles quite nicely. So it can uh, on the fly find out how many servers are alive and it will even not uh, going to route a request to a server which is no longer alive. And finally, uh, you can implement your own rule-based load balancing. So by default, it supports round robin, but you can implement uh, your own load balancing by extending a class. Uh, the third concept, uh, and it's the second last concept before I will dive into the code, is uh, edge service. So for instance, imagine a scenario that you were providing APIs to the consumer and your boss comes and say, now from tomorrow we are going to charge them money and we want to authenticate every request coming to. So um, this is one use case. But another use case is, for instance, you want to start tracking all the information, for example, some matrices uh, for your APIs. And in a distributed world, when we want to do something uh, all together with a bunch of our microservices, there is a concept which we can use a gateway pattern. And edge is nothing but uh, is another way. Basically, it's a gateway pattern. So all the requests that comes through go through a gateway, and you can uh, do some uh, some relevant stuff. And Zool is the one that I'm going to talk about. And it consists of three uh, stages, or you can say filters. Uh, so pre-routing and post. And if something goes wrong in this stage, there is a fallback stage, that's error stage. So when a HTTP request comes to a Zool, it first goes through pre-stage. And in pre-stage, you can do some uh, logic like authenticating, for instance, your client. And you can write n number of pre-filters here. Uh, but once, let's say, you are done with your pre-staging logic, the request get routed uh, to the second stage. And in routing stage, you can, for instance, uh, figure out where to route the request. So you can implement dynamically routing of request. And once the request is routed, then the final stage, that is a post stage, comes into action. And what you can do in post stage, for instance, you can add default HTTP headers. So, or you can expose some um, health matrices uh, for your microservices. And during the end of this talk, I'm going to show you how exposing um, matrices looks like in production. And finally, the request, uh, uh, the response is uh, handed over to the, to the client. Uh, you may ask that, well, this looks quite, quite uh, simple, so why we have to use Zool in order to do such a thing? We can just write a HTTP servlet uh, by our own and we can do it. Uh, well, there are tons of uh, cool feature in Zool, and one of them is load shedding, which means we can allocate capacity for um, for per request, and then Zool will start dropping those requests that goes above that load capacity. Uh, if you have to do authentication, Zool know how to pass the um, tokens and take care for you, so you don't have to scratch your hairs. Uh, Static response handling is something uh, that time to time developer needs. So for instance, sometimes you have a use case scenario that you don't want to route your request to an internal cluster and you just want to return response directly. So the client make a request and you don't want to even route it to an internal cluster. And don't ask me why, because we are developers and we have strange, strange, strange region, uh, reasons to do things. Um, and this is the feature that I like the most, the surgical debug filter. So let's say one of your client is trying to connect to your system and only that client experience some problem connecting with your system. What you can do is you can just um, add or create a surgical debug filter. It's written in Groovy, so you don't have to recompile uh, full your application and do a redeploy. You can just add a surgical debug filter, and then you can intercept the traffic coming from that particular client and inspect what's going on. Uh, the same concept can be applied not only for a particular client, but let's say if you are uh, hosting your microservices in east, west, or n number of zones, so you can just intercept problems that are only relevant for a particular zone. And finally, uh, stress testing. So let's say when we are building microservices and the Jenkins pipeline is green, what we can do is we can just put our build in a production and tell Zool to slowly and gradually increase the traffic. So we can say increase it 5%, 10%, 20%, and we can record and monitor how the build is performing 
in terms of response time. And let's say after 75%, we notice that the response time increased gradually or significantly. We can then repo, uh, report this to our uh, programmers and uh, they can fix it. So, I mean, we can just gradually increase the traffic rather than exposing 100% trafficking and then having no clue what's going on. The last concept is uh, failure management. And basically, if in distributed world, we have hundreds of moving parts. And hundreds of moving parts means that when you are going to speak with another person or another microservice, that microservice have, OK, it have to sign some SLA that it will be online, but let's say it is offline, uh, because it, we don't cannot restrict and assume that other persons which we are going to speak to they are going to be nice to us. And in order to handle those problems, uh, Hystrix uh, is something that we can use. Uh, and basically, it provides um, cyclic, um, uh, it provides circuit breaker pattern and some other cool stuff uh, baked into it. So now let me show you a demo. And I think I'm on time. So uh, I'm going to use Spring Cloud. Uh, you can do the same thing with Spring Framework, Spring Boot, or even using plain Java. Uh, I use just Spring Cloud because I am a bit of a kind of a lazy programmer and I don't want to do everything by my own and I want to use cool annotations. Uh, so the demo is going to use, uh, going to look something like this. We will build a catalog service that will represent uh, a use case in which a microservice have to communicate with a bunch of other microservices. And these, the right ones, they are going to represent a simple use case scenario like product price and comment so they are the comments uh, they will they will represent those microservices that are self sufficient they don't have to communicate with each other so let me show you the code how we can build it so um when we are starting obviously we have to um we can add those those annotations are coming from spring cloud and the full code is hosted here so you can go and read what I'm doing here. So I'm not going to go through each and every instruction here. Uh, but let me walk you through really fast. So first thing what we need to do, you remember the concept one, the Eureka. So Eureka consists of client and a server. So all what I need to do in order to enable Eureka is annotate my class with at enable Eureka server. Uh, and what's going to happen is Spring Cloud is going to fire a default Eureka server for me, listening on port 8761 with some defaults. Uh, you may ask, but what if I want to override them? So do the same thing in the Spring world. Just create a property files and override it, or even use an open source Netflix project or something like this, in which you can um, add the properties in somewhere in a Git repo so that uh, you don't have to even edit your project files. But once I have my uh, Eureka server up and running, I can go and start uh, creating my microservices. So for instance, I can create, uh, let's say, price service. Uh, the first thing I have to do is, since it, uh, uh, it is a microservice, I have to annotate it with at enable discovery client. And what it's going to do is, it's going to perform the client side interaction of Eureka. So now, I have a server up and running, and in order to register a client, I can annotate it with at enable discovery client. And that's all. I don't have to do anything more here. So now I can, for instance, start writing my, uh, my normal stuff. So here I have a REST controller. Yeah, by the way, all of you are, how many of you are aware from Spring Boot or using Spring Boot? Okay, so. Uh, basically, treat this code as a REST controller in whichever framework you will be writing it. So what I have here is I'm saying that I want to map the request coming to this URL slash price, and I want to return some mock objects here. Uh, and just to show you that there is nothing fancy here, I can go to the price class, and it's at immutable, it's just groovy syntax. I don't want my IntelliJ to vomit all the getter and setter and scroll through it. I just, that's why I use at immutable and I just have getter and setter, but it is not a requirement. You can add your getter and setter here. 
So um, that's how we can create a simple microservice, for instance, price service. And in the same way, I can create comment service and, um, and product service. But let me show you something more interesting. So how we can create uh, a microservice that needs to communicate with other microservices? Uh, so like all other microservices, first it have to register by using at enable discovery client. But here you see something new. Here I'm saying uh, my application to use and enable the history support. Uh, and why? Because this microservice need to communicate with other microservices which may or may not be up and running. So once I have it, I can just go and create a catalog service. So in catalog service, what I have, I have a get, uh, I have a request mapping here for a catalog. And all I do is for a given product ID, I just create a catalog. And how do I create a catalog? I build it using fetching a product, comments and price, and then just assembling it in a POJO here. So catalog is nothing fancy here. It's just a POJO class, as you can see. Uh, but fetching the products, how do we do it? So first thing I need is I need a load balancer here, uh, the client side, the ribbon. And in Spring Cloud, what we can do is we can just use an annotation at load balanced. Um, and I'm going to get my client side load balancer. And that's it. And once I have it, I can start fetching my products here. So for instance, here you can see I'm fetching uh, the products and this, those of you who are not using Spring Framework, just treat it like you just make a, a get request and parse the response uh, to some uh, class. So here I'm just asking for JSON, I mean asking for uh, an object and mapping it to product class. But an interesting thing that you can notice here is this, this full operation is running as under at hystrix command. And why I'm doing it is because when I'm making this request, there is no guarantee that this price service will be up and running. So I say, okay, if it will be not up and running, then just return some dummy or demo product. Uh, this is not a requirement here. You can just skip the fallback all together, and then you will get just some um, old school stack trace. But here I just want to demonstrate that in case of fallback, we can provide some default behavior. So for instance, here we are fetching comments and we are returning an empty array. Uh, only one thing that you should pay attention is if you are implementing a fallback method, just avoid making another uh, HTTP request because then you are back where you started. So in fallback, you if you make an HTTP request and that service is down, so you have to somehow handle it. Um, the final piece of the puzzle is this, URLs. How these URLs are getting resolved? Uh, so remember our Zool, this <coughs> gateway server. So here I can go uh, and again, create another Spring Boot application. All I need is I need to annotate this class with at enable Zool proxy, and then I can start coding. Uh, so here, I can just go and create an application dot YML. And what I'm doing here is um, this part is interesting to you, and rest is not so interesting. What I can do here is I can say that Okay, for instance, my this microservice, I want to map it like this. And here I can define, so those, those URLs that were coming from here, here I'm providing the mapping for them. Uh, all right, so now let me show you how all this tech stack works together. Okay, so I think it's readable, yeah, to all of you. Okay, so um, I can make, for instance, a request on localhost 8761. This is a port where my default Eureka server is up and running. And as you see, I get some, some JSON, which is, a, which is some gibberish data right now. But believe me or not, if I parse this data, there is some useful info in it. So now when I parse this JSON, uh, then you can see that I have information about on which port my particular microservice is running and how many instances uh, are there. I can fetch this 
info also uh, but for those of you who don't want to use command line or just for your devops team uh, this is the default uh, page generated by spring spring cloud so here you can see i have uh, as promised catalog common price product and zool services up and running i have the availability i have their status and even the zone and here i have bunch of some uh, other general information so now we can try for instance to make a request for fetching a particular catalog so when i fetch uh, a particular catalog you can see that i get uh, a product uh, a catalog with an id 12 and it have this product and comment so if i make this request again and let me show you show you here so as you see when i'm making a request here my circuit is open, uh, my circuit is closed right now. And you can see fetch comments, fetch price, and fetching product. Everything is green here. Um, but let me do something more, uh, more realistic. Uh, so let me blow my comment service here. Uh, so I can kill my comment service here. And as you remember, in Uh, as you remember, in, in comment service, when I'm fetching it, I'm using hysterix here. So I'm, what I'm saying is when I fetch, and if something goes wrong, return an empty array of comments. So in the worst case, my user is just going to see no comments, and he can continue shopping. Um, so uh, now if I make... Uh, make a request here, you instantly can notice that I have no comments here. So my fallback method is invoked here. I can go and ask uh, Eureka, for instance, and you can see I have no comment service here. And I can validate the same fact using, uh, using the browser. So I can go here and you probably will have no comment service here. So now if you take a look here, and when I'm making a request, uh, not here, I'm making a request here, uh, you still see that I have something wrong with comment service, but still my circuit is closed. So I mean, this thing doesn't change, only the color of the request is red. Uh, but let me show you the real advantage of using um, hysterix here. So let's say I'm going to issue 100 or 1000 or 100 million requests, doesn't matter. As soon as I issue those requests, you see that all of a sudden my circuit is now open. And what open circuit means is that all the requests that I'm making to this particular microservice are getting short circuit, which means that even hysterix Thanks to Hysterix, I'm not even going and asking whether this comment service is alive or not. Um, what it does is you can configure the parameters that how much, um, how much time or how many requests it have taken into consideration before opening or closing a circuit. Uh, and Hysterix will do so. And the final thing that I want to show you uh, here is we can Dockerize, because today we have so many talks about Docker. So why not end this talk also with Docker? Uh, here I have the, the same microservices packed uh, in Docker. So I can grab those images and I have uh, them. How did I build them? Well, if I go fast here, So if I go here, I, I have a Docker Compose file, uh, which defines how I want to deploy my services. So I can, thanks to Docker Compose up minus D, I can run those services. Here, I created microservice demo Eureka ser service. And how does I did it? I use a Gradle plugin to build this. But you can write even um, plain Docker file 
which um, specify how you want to copy your um, output and uh, the result will be same but here I have a Gradle plugin that builds this image for me I can pass some environment variables uh, and here I'm doing the port mapping so the port running inside the docker container I'm mapping it to 8761 um, and And what I did, just to show you uh, the last part of the puzzle, the distributed uh, tracking, is inside the Docker container, I just use thread.sleep, which means that now when I will invoke this service inside the Docker, and this Docker is something which I mapped in my, um, uh, in my file, because it's like local host because I'm running Docker in, on Mac and uh, so this is how I'm resolving it rather than typing the full IP. And as you see, it took some time here. And right now, if I'm using this on production, I have no clue what's going on in production, why it takes so long time, where the real problem is. So what I can do is I can use a library called Zipkin it's based on a paper uh, released in 2010 by Google Dapper. It's so Google released the paper and Twitter implemented. Uh, so, but what what uh, this paper does is it targets how we can do large scale distributed tracing of requests. So, for instance, here I have um, Zipkin. I can go here. I can pick, for instance, my Zool service and say find traces. And here you can see that full, uh, full request took nine spans. And you can read the paper what span and everything means. I will not go into detail. But here I have a uh, full life cycle of my event. So full catalog took this much time. And here and here I added the thread.sleep. So as you can see, these requests took much more time. And I can zoom in and uh, see much more information what happens there. So that's what I all in the demo that I wanted to show you. So back to the slides. So what are the pros and cons of using microservices? So first of all, we are let's let's discuss about the good things. So we are in a component oriented <laughs> approach. So rather than a layer architecture, we are thinking about components. Um, in microservices, we have the possibility to use the richer tech stack. So we are not confined to use particular tech stack for upcoming five, 10 years. Um, scalability is something that microservices address uh, quite, quite nicely. And as I demonstrated, uh, it is quite resilient also. So if one part of my application blows up, my full application still can somehow work uh, on a production environment. But the price to pay for the microservice is now we are having hundreds of distributed components, which means we have to manage somehow those components, which in turn require to build some arsenal of tools. Uh, back in days when, I mean now, microservices, Netflix have open sourced a lot of tools, but imagine a days when people were doing microservices or we were doing, we have to build some of those tools by our own. Um, testing is something which you again have to think. Uh, in my monolithic world, you have a single application and microservice, you have a bunch of comp components, so you have to rethink the testing phase and transaction, so you have to think about the acid and mutual and eventual consistency. Uh, microservices in real life looks much more uh, complicated. Uh, so you need a bunch of tools, not only those four that I demonstrated. These are a bunch of them which we use um, in production. And uh, also, I spoke about matrices. So here you can see uh, we, are, we have you know, the old school matrices like thread state, DB connection, memory, all those stuff. But also, in microservices, it comes quite handy when we are building for our uh, customers that we can expose some business matrices. So for instance, on the top corner on the right hand side we have orders processed and this is a matrix that we expose by our own uh, in order to monitor how particular or how many numbers of uh, orders are processed in last 5, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so 
thank you all for your attention. Uh, we still have five minutes for questions. So if you have any questions, I'm here. Uh, okay, so um, I can show you something. You ask for it. <laughs> so there is another application that I created. Uh, it's hosted on on Amazon. It's under free cloud, free accounts. So what I did here is I just I created an application using only limited set of those tools that I show you. So for instance, let's say Hystrix is the one that make more sense for me to use. Start using it right now. I can just integrate it. So this is a simple application where I can search for uh, some food trucks within X number of miles and it just render it on a page. Uh, it is not a microservice, but I'm demonstrating here that someone who want to start using just bunch of uh, tools or want to migrate slowly. Uh, and here I'm just making every uh, five seconds, I think, or every two seconds. I don't remember a request to a external uh, API, which is not like mocked by me or controlled by me. It's provided by, uh, uh, I think, open data or something like this. Um, and it integrates quite, quite well. And even you don't have to use Eureka, you can use console. You just have to change in the build.gradle, the dependency. You don't have to change the annotations. And it will take care of all of it. So the kind of the, the API is going to be the same, right? so there will be slightly different, so you won't be able to swap out one service to another in real life, because they will have slightly different PR names. Yes, yeah, so if you are, um, as long as you are not uh, using a vendor-specific API, you are free to move those components, but if you are using some vendor-specific features of uh, Eureka or Consul or whatever, then yeah, you, you have to somehow manage those interoperabilities. Yeah. What were you using for metrics? Okay, so I'm... Um, on, on GitHub, I have uh, wrote how you can do the same thing, but we were using Grafana and Graphite to build those, um, build those matrices. Um, now, and also, uh, we were using, uh, I forgot the name, I can check it, um, some uh, open source tool that allows to uh, expose some health matrices. And obviously, Spring Boot also provides some basic actuator. But for the graph side, we were using Grafana and Graphite to create those. Yeah? So, in terms of which parts of the application need to be on the static parts, the static ports, and I believe it gets over, presumably it's all in, it's, you know, stays for whatever it is, and more to store it. But then does all you, Eureka, discover where the microservice Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So Yuri So you, um, if I understand your question correctly, you mean if we deploy the same infrastructure on cloud or something like this, where there are large number of machines are running and we don't want to couple with tech stack. That's that's what you mean? Ah, oh yeah, for sure. I mean, um, if you don't, um, if you are going to use service registry Eureka, then you need a client and a server, because somewhere you have to register the information. 
But if you are using some other flavor, then yeah, you don't need Eureka server. And also you don't have to, uh, you can do, you can run Eureka server with a replication. So you can say, for instance, I want to run, oh, time's up. Uh, you want to run 10 a Eureka server or three Eureka server in a replica set. So if one of them blows or goes down, you don't have a central point of failure. Then others have the same information in a distributed world. Okay, so thanks all. Thank you.